Welcome to my garage. It's one of my favorite places. I enjoy my garage. I really like it. You see, this is where we're going to do the sermon from today. While I really like my garage, I don't want to be confined to my garage. I don't want it to be the only place that I can go. I don't want it to be where I'm, well, I hate to use the word stuck, but where I find myself without having opportunity to go anywhere else. Because this is a place I enjoy, but it has its limitations. It doesn't have everything that I need. As uh, conditions around us deteriorate quickly, we are asked to abide by more and more restrictions. Um, I went to get my hair cut last week, and when I called to see if they were open, they told me they were only taking appointments. So I made an appointment. I go to Big League Barber. It's not like I go to a hair salon or anything. Well, when I arrived there, there was a sign on the door, more than one sign, said, warning, uh, you, you cannot enter. We're not taking walk-ins. Uh, haircuts are by appointment only, and then they give you the phone number to call. Well, I was a little early, so I went in and sat down, and two of the girls who were cutting hair were waiting for someone to come in, so they had come to the, to the front, and they were there talking. And they were talking with each other about how odd it was that somebody calls and they're standing right on the other side of the glass looking at them while they're answering the phone and talking. But this is where we're at right now. Uh, when I sat down, I noticed there, there weren't any magazines. There, all the magazines were removed from the waiting area. Sitting there was all I could do. But really, sitting there was all I wanted to do. Um, you know, we've had more and more restrictions placed on us. And when that happens, whenever we get restrictions placed on us, we can become rebellious, crabby, depressed, angry, despondent, complacent. You could probably add to that list. But any of these, all of these can be detrimental to our physical health as well as our spiritual health, our relationship with God. Now, that's the one I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about our physical health, too. But our relationship with God is really what I want to look at. Uh, last Saturday, I was at the church building when the Allen County uh, Health Commissioner made the announcement banning all church gatherings of 10 or more. Well, we had already decided we weren't going to be gathering, but just hearing that, it was, uh, I, I left the church about 6.30 that evening, and I was going through the basement. I was making sure everything was shut off, doors were closed. It's just one of the things I do before I leave. And just realizing that we, weren't, we were not going to be gathered there the next day like we usually do. That we weren't going to be able to gather together. It was, it was sad. Um, it, was, it was a feeling I, I didn't like. I didn't, I didn't care for. I, I thought it's like being in prison where you know, you are, you, you know people that care about you are around, but you, yet you, you are forbidden, you're forbidden from seeing them. We've been looking at Joseph in the book of Genesis. And as we've been looking at Joseph, um, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was a favorite son. Uh, and then, well, he irritated his brothers. We'll get into that in a minute again. Just to, But he went from favorite son to that spot of being unable to see any of his family. Couldn't see any of his family at all. Now, at the end of the chapter we looked at last week, chapter 39, uh, Joseph was thrown in prison. Well, the chapter we're looking at today, Joseph is still in prison. Well, let's pray, and we're going to turn into our, our text for today. Father, thank you that you are a God who brings freedom regardless of our surroundings, regardless of the oppression that's there. I think of our brothers and sisters in countries where they are truly oppressed and can't worship, even as we are now by video. They can't even do that. 
and Lord, we have tremendous freedom, but even they have that freedom in Christ. I pray that you would help us to see, to understand your word and your truth more as we look into it today. Uh, that the things we glean from your word would help us to be your people more and more. Every day, really every moment of every day. So guide our thoughts, even as we are apart from one another, uh, we are together with you. And for that, I'm grateful. So help and guide, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 40 today. I hope you can see the screen. Um, it looked fine when I was checking on the camera. I hope it still is. <laughs> Actually, I don't even know if you can see me, but that's not such a drawback. Another subject. Anyway, last week we saw how Joseph lived with integrity in the 39th chapter, how he lived with integrity even in the face of very direct, very powerful temptation. In chapter 39, he was in Potiphar's house. He, be, he was purchased by Potiphar as the Ishmaelites came and brought him. Uh, into Egypt, and he was uh, put in, in as a slave. He was working as a slave in Potiphar's home. He did such a good job. Potiphar noticed how well he was doing, how God, it says, he noticed how God was, was with him. And um, so what he did then was uh, he, promoted, he promoted Joseph. Uh, I just realized I forgot to turn my phone off. Um, he promoted Joseph. Uh, to the place where he was in charge of his whole household. And while he was in charge of his whole household, Potiphar's wife, uh, well, she, um, she was attracted to Joseph, and she pursued him. She said, sleep with me. He wouldn't do it. He said, I can't sin against God. And she continued, it says, she continued to do that. Well, one thing led to another. Uh, she grabbed Joseph one time when he was in the home. Joseph took off, left his coat behind rather than uh, then give in to temptation rather than sin. And Mrs. Mrs. Potiphar then uh, called her husband, called the, the ser other servants, called her husband, and accused Joseph of things he didn't do. Joseph was thrown in prison. So even though he was there, you know, in the fa face of very powerful temptation, uh, we saw that, you know, we, we can't control how other people were at, will act. We're not responsible for how they act. We can't control that. But we can control how we, we, how we react. So even though they may act uh, sinfully, we need to react in a way that honors God. Uh, and then people may act against us. They may lie about us. That's what happened to Joseph. You know, they may lie about us and, um, and might work really hard to harm us. That's how it seems Mrs. Potiphar acted toward Joseph. But we're still to live for God. We are still to live with integrity. Um, he was lied about, falsely accused, maintained his integrity toward God. Now, he wasn't spared trouble. Because he lived with integrity toward God, he was not spared trouble. He was thrown in prison. And, you know, the, 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 in prison, it says he still maintained his integrity. He followed God at the end of chapter 39. We see that. And he was eventually raised up to a place where he was running the prison. But he was still a slave. He was a slave. He was a prisoner. It, just because he was living for God, the outside external things didn't seem to be going real well there. So how should we live when we're in a place we do not want to be? When we're, in, you know, when, when we're waiting for better days, when we find ourselves in a place we never thought we would be, how are we to live? You know, why, how do we live while we're waiting for things to change. How do we live while we're in the waiting room? Well, let's learn from Joseph how he handled uh, the waiting room he never wanted, never imagined he would be in. Begin with me, verse 1, Genesis chapter 40, beginning with verse 1. It says, After this, the Egyptian king's cupbearer and baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them into custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned Joseph to them, and he became their personal attendant. And they were in custody for some time. Now, we're going to pause there for a minute. The, the very first words where it says, after this, after this simply means after Joseph was thrown in jail. Now, we're not told how long that was till the events of this chapter begin to unfold. But we were told at the end of chapter 39, it was long enough for the jailer to notice Joseph's work 
and his work ethic, how he were, and the fact that God was with him, and increased Joseph's responsibility all the way to the place of running the jail. That's all at the end of chapter 39. Now here again, we're given the indication that Joseph's time in jail was not a short stint, not only from what we read in the end of 39, uh, for that time to, for the jailer to notice, but here it says at the end of verse 4 uh, that they were in custody for some time. It wasn't, the, the, the indication is it was not a short stint. Now it's hard to wait. You know, it's hard for us to wait, particularly when the situation you're in is not pleasant. In Joseph's case, it was bad. Their prisons were quite unpleasant. Um, that's a polite way of saying that they were just nasty little snot holes. Uh, you know, they were meant to be unpleasant. They were meant to be uncomfortable for the people. Uh, they were meant to be punishment. That's what it was. They were meant to be punishment. They weren't meant to be uh, a, a step up. They weren't meant to be where everything was taken care of. They were meant for punishment. Now the cupbearer and the baker, they were important officials really in, in the service of the king. They had very important roles. Uh, they ensured that what the king ate and drank was of high quality. That, were, that they were things that were fit for a king. They were also responsible to make sure that they weren't poisoned. That someone w didn't try to poison the king. Now they did that by, well, quite possibly getting poisoned themselves. Um, but it, what happened also, because they were in that very trusted position, they were often also seen as advisors to the king where the king would, would consult them and would talk to them and talk some matters over with them. So it was more than just a, a simple servant. It was someone who was trusted by the king. And so now they're pulled away from those duties and they're in jail. They're in jail where they couldn't perform those duties. They couldn't do what they were used to doing. They couldn't live in the manner in which they were used to living. Uh, they no longer had that face-to-face -face with the king. Everything had changed there. Now, as I was thinking about that and looking at this, uh, you know, for us, it's, it's um, I got to go the right way. Everyone finds themselves in a waiting room situation sometime. All of us do. We all find ourselves in that situation uh, where, where we're waiting. We find ourselves in a situation somewhere that we would rather not be, a place that we don't, we don't want to be at. Things are happening and, and we don't want them happening. You know, doing things, taking care of things we would rather not have to deal with. Sometimes, you know, it, it is literally waiting for a situation to change. Uh, you know, sometimes I don't think we realize we're quite in a waiting room. But often we do. There's just that little bit we want, a little bit, I was going to say more, uh, there's you know a little bit further we want to go. Sometimes it's facing opposition that keeps you away from where you think you should be. Uh, this is was true for the the cupbearer and the baker. It was also true for Joseph. You'll see that as we get into this next section here. But you know, sometimes you just have to finish where you're at before you can move on. It's just another step in the journey. So you know, the waiting room sometimes is just simply another step in the journey for us. It's just another step to get not not necessarily, I was going to say where we want, but where God wants us. I think that's the focus we need to have. I think that's how we need to begin looking at that. Uh, one of the things that we need to realize too is it's often out of our control, at least from our viewpoint. From our viewpoint, it's, it's out of control, period. Not just out of our control, it's just flat out out of control. Because if it were up to us, things wouldn't be happening this way. If it were up to us, we wouldn't be where we're at. Things wouldn't be unfolding like they are. Things would be much different. Well, when I see the cup baker, the, the baker and the cup bearer here with Joseph, um, I'm reminded that God's timing is perfect. Uh, you know, it, it's perfect. God is not late. He is not running behind. It's not like I too often do where he's got 
where he has overcommitted himself. Overcommitted himself, that, that, that's a term that doesn't even apply to God. Uh, it, it's not in a place, you know, he's not late. Uh, there is, I don't believe there's any coincidence with God. The fact that the cupbearer and the baker are here is not a coincidence. The fact that they are there with Joseph is not a coincidence. This is the plan of God unfolding. I don't think Joseph realized it at the time. Those of us who know the rest of the story can see it, but Joseph couldn't see it while he's in it. You know, we need to realize God's not late. There is no coincidence. You know, God has this. He is not surprised by where you are. God is not a bit surprised by where you are. He knows right where you're at, and he is there with you. He hasn't left you on your own. You know, Joseph here finds himself as the attendant to these two prisoners. Favorite son to a slave to a prisoner and now an attendant to other prisoners. Let's pick up verse 5. The Egyptian king's cupbearer and baker who were confined in the prison each had a dream. Both had a dream on the same night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him in the master's house, Why do you look so sad today? We had dreams, they said to him, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. In my dream, there was a vine in front of me. On the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is its interpretation, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift your head and restore you to your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well for you, remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should put me in a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was positive, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. Three baskets of white bread were on my head. In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is its interpretation, Joseph replied. The three baskets are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off of you and hang you on a tree. Then the birds will eat the flesh from your body. We're going to pause at that rather disgusting picture right there. Um, so these guys, every once in a while I'm asked, I'm, I'm asked about dreams, if God still uses them today as we see here. Um, certainly God could use dreams. But one of the things I think we need to realize is even in the Bible, this was rare. It was never a normal course of events. We can pick out a few here and there, and when we try to jam them all together, we think, oh, well, you know, God, this is one of... Here's Joseph. He had dreams. You know, he had those two dreams. Now we're not told that he continued having dreams. Uh, we, we know that, um, well, Pharaoh will have a dream here in a bit. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, we, we see others have dreams. Mary, or Joseph, excuse me, Joseph had a dream when he was about to divorce Mary. But those are the only times. There's thousands of years between those experiences. It's not a normal unfolding way, not a normal course of event. It's not the normal way uh, God led people. I've told you before, uh, most of my dreams are pretty wacky. Uh, they're, they're just strange. Um, I, I hate the ones in particular where I'm trying to run, and it's just like I just, my legs just won't move. <laughs> like they're made, uh, you know, like I have concrete weights on, on my feet. But it, most of my dreams are wacky. But way back in chapter 37, um, Joseph had two dreams. 
his first one, he and his brothers were bringing in sheaves of grain, they said. And as Joseph uh, brought in his, their sheaves, his brother's sheaves of grain, bowed down to Joseph's. Well, he shared that with his brothers and um, they, it irritated them. Well, then he has another dream, the second dream. It said, he said the sun, the moon, and 11 star, stars were bowing down to him. Now this time he told his, he shared the dream uh, with his family, his brothers as well of, as his father, and his father even took exception to it. You know, Israel took exception to it. Uh, you know, and it, well, the result was his brothers got ticked off and that's how he ended up getting sold uh, to the Ishmaelites as a slave a discount slave at that, half the price of a slave, and then was taken to Egypt and sold as a slave. Well, this time here, Joseph is not the one having the dreams. He is only hearing about the dreams. Notice he responds well. Notice in verse 8. He says, Don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. He's expressing faith in God here. He is expressing faith in God as the source and leader of his life. He's expressing, he's expressing the fact that God is the one who sets our direction. That he brings God into the picture as the leader, as the one who is, who is head of all this. Now Joseph could have lifted himself up, but he chose to lift God up. And that's what we need to do. We need to lift up God rather than ourself. Draw attention to him. Help people to see him. Joseph could have Joseph could have said, well, "I can interpret your dream. Just yeah, come on, I could take it." But he he said, "Don't interpretations belong to God." He lifts God up. You know, he he's drawing people to him. What you can do, the talents you have, the abilities that you have, are all a gift from God anyway. In First Corinthians, chapter twelve, it says, "Now there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. Uh, there are different ministries, but the same Lord." And there are different activities, but the same God activates each gift in each person. The same God. God is the one who activates these gifts. God is the one who gives these gifts. God is the one who makes them useful. God is the one who, who, to whom we should be serving with them. In Ephesians, we read, it says, Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of of the Messiah's gift. Again, a gift from God. What was given to us is a gift from God. Those talents, those abilities that we think, uh, you know, that, that, that are ours, they are a gift from God. Even those ones we practice. And you practice these and you get better at them, but that doesn't mean they're not a gift from God. He is the one who gives us the gifts. He is the one who gives us the abilities. Well, here, Joseph places his ability to interpret dreams under God's authority, not his own ability. Don't, he says, don't interpretations belong to God? He draws the attention to God, says, this is from God, and then he says, then he says, tell me your dreams. Well, the cupbearer tells him his dream first, and Joseph tells the cupbearer that Pharaoh will lift up his head and restore the cupbearer to his position. A, a good answer. A, 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 well, a good answer in the sense of this would be what the cupbearer wanted to hear. Now he also tells the cupbearer and asks him to remember to tell Pharaoh about him being in prison, about Joseph being in prison, you know, and imprisoned unfairly. Well, the baker then feels safe to tell Joseph his dream. It says that he heard the interpretation and it went well, so he tells Joseph his dream as well. Now Joseph tells the baker Pharaoh will also lift up his head. He will lift his head up, uh, but he would lift it off of him uh, and hang him. A more literal translation is impale him on a pole. Uh, neither one sounds very pleasant. I, I doubt that you will ever have to tell someone they're going to be hung or impaled on a pole. At least I hope you never have to tell anyone something like that. But what we need to remember is we need to speak the truth, even when it is difficult. Speak the truth even when it is difficult. Now don't just stop there because you will miss the, the broader context of what God tells us with this. You know, Because this does not mean that we can speak the truth, that we tell the truth in a rude or hurtful way. Uh, you know, we've looked at this many times before, but we, need, we always need to remember it. Ephesians chapter 5, but speaking the truth in love, 
Let us grow in every way into him who is the head. Christ knows what he says. Speak the truth in love. We need to speak the truth, but we need to do it in love. The, 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 the goal of it, notice, is to grow so that we may grow in Christ, so that we may may be more in Christ and we need to speak it in love. If we are struggling with that, if we are struggling with that, we need to wait until we get to the place where we can speak the truth in love. We need to we need to be to be further transformed by God so that we can speak the truth in love according to his word, according to his truth. Now, that also means we don't speak something other than the truth. So, uh, you know, Ephesians chapter 5, since you put away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Don't avoid, don't evade the truth, and certainly don't tell a lie. He says, speak the truth to each other. And again, the goal is to build up, you know, that we are, that we are building up. You know, some things are hard to hear. That's what we said, speak the truth even when it's difficult. And some things are hard to hear, but it needs to be said in love. We need to speak the truth, but we need to do it in love. We need to speak it in a manner of building up. In Proverbs chapter 27, it says, The wounds of a friend are trustworthy. The wounds of a friend are trustworthy. We speak the truth even when it's difficult. Not to put someone in their place, but because we care. The wounds of a friend. We speak the truth in love because we care. And it's not so that they'll do things our way. But it's because we care. The wounds of a friend we need to speak the truth even when it's difficult. We need to do it in love. We need to be speaking the truth, not evading the truth. We need to be doing it as a friend. We need to be doing it in order to build up. We need to be doing it in order to strengthen. We need to be doing it in order to bring them and build them up in Christ. Let's finish this chapter off. Verse 20. On the third day, after the dream, this is the third day after the dream, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he gave a feast for all his servants. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. That just means that you know, he, was, he was calling them up, he was raising them up, he was calling them out of the prison. Verse 21, Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position as cupbearer, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had explained to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So three days after the dream, three days after the dream, you know, sure enough, Pharaoh indeed called for the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. Things unfolded just as God revealed to Joseph, just as God revealed through Joseph. Joseph, and Joseph then relays it to the men. We need to make sure that we always give God's word. We give God's message, God's word, not our own. Certainly not our own opinion. If your thoughts go contrary to God's word, keep them to yourself and then work them through so they are more in line with God. But you always give God's message. You give God's word any message you give to somebody should be in line with God's word. Any advice you give to somebody should be in line with God's word. Any truth that you give to somebody, the truth has to be in line with God's word. If it's contrary to God's word, it's not truth. If it's contrary to God's word, then it's false. It's a lie. It shouldn't be told. It shouldn't be passed on. You give it you what's according to God's word, according to his, his message. That's what we speak. That's what we share. That's what Joseph shared. He shared what God had told him. Now again, God's not going to tell you something that is contrary to his word. It will be in line with his word. It will be in harmony with his word. You know, we're sometimes surprised when things happen just as God said. 
2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, difficult times will come in the last days. Now we could stop right there. We could stop right there and say, yes, yes, we, we've arrived at this place. Some of us were in this place before this happened. It doesn't have to be that, the, that, that, that we have some virus for it to find ourselves in a difficult place. Some of you have found yourselves in difficult places. Uh, some due to health, some due to you know, choices of others, some due to you know, uh, uh, just, well, sometimes due to choices, poor choices you made, sinful choices that you make. We, can, we find ourselves in difficult times. He says, difficult times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, what a picture that is, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness but denying its power. And he tells us, avoid these people. We're not to be these people. These are things that should not, should not characterize God's people in any way, in any shape or form. Well, Pharaoh's celebrating his birthday. What a crazy way to celebrate your birthday. He restores a relationship. He restores one relationship. That's a good thing. That's a good thing to do. It's, it's always a good time to restore a relationship. Uh, you know, if you have one that needs to be restored, it's always a good time to do that. Th that that's part of the message of Scripture, that we're reconciled, us with God and us to each other. So he restores one relationship and he kills another guy. Through all of this, the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. Don't you think you would have, don't you think that you would have remembered that? It was only three days ago. It was only three days earlier, Joseph told him, you know, here and explain to them. Here's what here's what you know. God says these mean, and here's here's what it is. Now it's tough to be forgotten. It's particularly tough to be forgotten by someone you've helped. Joseph helped. Well, I was going to say both of these guys. He did in the sense that the baker would have had some time to realize he needed to um, get things right. But uh, you know, he, he certainly helped the one who was still there, the cupbearer. And the cupbearer flat out forgot him. Now, one of the ways to lessen the hurt is how you help people in the first place. Now, the answer is not to help people less. I've heard, I don't know how many times I've seen uh, people's comments online or I've talked with people and, you know, they've, they've said, you know, I've helped them before. I'm not helping them again. You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? No, 70 times seven. Uh, so the answer is not to help people less. Here's, here's, I think, part of the guidance for us. We need to help people with no expectation of return. We need to help them without expecting anything in return. That's the way we are called to help people. We are called to help them with no expectation of return. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, You have heard uh, that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's how it was, and that's how too many people operate today. Even too many of some people who call themselves God's people. Uh, love your enemy and, uh, excuse me, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus turns that completely around. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. 
We're called to love our neighbor. That, that's the love, that, that's the action word of, of agape. You know, to love our neighbor. To, you know, it's not warm, fuzzy feelings. That's not this love that's talked about. It's not having warm, fuzzy feelings toward them. It's to act in their best interest with no regard for return. We're acting in their best interest with no regard for how they may respond to us, with no regard at all except their best interest. This is the way God loves us. For God so loved the world, there's that same word. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you think every single person in the world comes to faith in Christ? We know they don't. How many people did Jesus die for? For God so loved the world. The provision is there for everyone. Everyone doesn't accept it. Everyone doesn't come into that relationship with Christ. But the provision was made. If they, if they did come, the provision was made. This is the way God loves us. This is the way God calls us to love others. He says, I tell you to love your enemies, your enemies. Those, it, it, it's, it's easy for me to love Ginny. I don't always do it as well as I should, but it's easy for me to love her. She makes it easy for me. Well, there's other people who don't make it quite so easy. Uh, there are some people who don't like me. I can live with that. But here's the point. I'm still called to love them. I am called to love them. Pharaoh's cupbearer forgot about Joseph. So Joseph finds himself in a waiting room he doesn't want to be in. He didn't want to be in this waiting room. It's out of his control. It's out of control completely from Joseph's viewpoint. But God's timing was perfect. He was in the waiting room. Now, he was still living for God. We're told you know, be, he did before. It's, I think, safe to assume he did afterwards. Uh, you know, it, God's timing is perfect. Jo Joseph couldn't see it now, but he would see it years later. And the chapter's coming up, it'll unfold, and we'll see how Joseph could see it years later. You know, Joseph chose to lift God up, to draw people's attention to God. He spoke the truth, even when it was difficult. Even when it was difficult, he spoke the truth, and he continued to help others through all of this. I think something very important for us to see here is God can use you right where you are at. Joseph did not want to be here. This was not the, Joseph wanted to be somewhere else. He, he wanted to be somewhere else. In fact, that's what, you know, he, he felt he deserved better. That's what he told, that's what he told the cupbearer. He said, you know, in verse 14, but when all goes well for you, he's talking to the cupbearer, when all goes well for you, when you get lifted up, remember that I was with you. Please, please show kindness to me. Mention me to Pharaoh. Get me out of this prison. Get me out of here. I want this changed. I want this to be different. I want to be in a different place. Get me out of here. He says, I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. How unfair is that? I was kidnapped. Even here, he says, I've done nothing. I have done nothing that they should put me in the dungeon. Joseph felt he deserved better. He felt he deserved to be somewhere else. Yet here he was in the waiting room. And while he was in that waiting room, he continued to live for God. He continued to serve others in God's name. He continued to lift God up. When you find yourself in the waiting room, continue to live for God and serve others in his name. No matter where you are at, right where you are at, continue to live for God, continue to serve others in his name. It is not always easy, but it is always best. I have told you before, I have never, ever regretted following God. 
I have never, ever regretted doing what God says. I have never, ever regretted following his word. It's not always easy, but it is always best. God knows where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows right where you are. Trust him and live for him. Those go together. Trust him and live for him. When you find yourself in the waiting room, continue to live for God and serve others in his name. Live for his glory, even in the waiting room. Father, thank you for your grace to us that is not limited to only those places that we think we should be. It's not limited only to those places that we find pleasant. It's not limited only to those, to those places and those times in which life seems to be going on a good roll for us. But your power, your presence is with us even in the waiting room, even in those darkest moments, even when we find ourselves in the place that we never wanted to be, facing situations, challenges, and people that we wouldn't wish on our enemies even. Father, help us to always live for you. Help us to trust you. Help us to live for you, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. I don't know when we'll be back together. I hope it's soon. But right now, I guess we're kind of in the waiting room on that, aren't we? I'm praying for you. Pray for me as well. Thank you.